Hi, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video five. Um, we are starting uh, module A2 in the uh, Tweedy Golf uh, lecture notes that we're following. Uh, they call it advanced Rust syntax, but really it's like enough Rust syntax that you can start writing Rust code and it kind of makes sense. So we're going to talk about um, borrowing. Uh, mostly we're going to talk about borrowing and references in this video. We'll get on to structs and error handling later. Um, okay, so let's recap. Um, last time we talked about ownership. So um, uh, this is a concept that in some other languages you just don't have. Um, and it's the way that we manage memory stuff in Rust. And what we talked about before was that um, whenever there, whenever something, some kind of value gets created, um, then there is an owner. That owner will be a variable. Um, and there'll be, the ownership will be, there'll be, there's, the, there's some kind of stack value that holds onto the thing. So we talked about the stack and the heap and how things on the stack are like simple and you know, you know their size. And then things on the heap are, um, variable size. By the way, that, that's not really true. Like a lot of the things we're talking about being on the stack are actually on the heap, but the kind of meaning of them fits that thing. So, um, don't get, don't get too carried away with the way we're using those words. Um, the, the things that we talked about being on the stack are kind of things that could be on the stack and sometimes are on the stack. Anyway, um, so an example of that would be if you hold a load of things in a, in a VEC, like all the things that you hold in a VEC are actually on the heap because they're in a VEC, including the things that hold references to other things. Maybe I'm just really confusing you. Um, but anyway, um, uh, the point is everything has an owner. Uh, and the owner is a variable and variables go out of scope when they get to the cl closing curly bracket of their scope. Um, and they, not only does the thing that on the stack get cleaned up, but the thing they point to on the heap also gets cleaned up at that moment. Um, and then the, the last bullet point here is just uh, emphasizing that all, everything I just told you is true for most stuff in Rust, but there are other types, um, simple, types where everything kind of completely fits on the stack and these often get marked as copy which is like an explicit thing you can do in your code and that means um, that they uh, um, when you when you create a new variable pointing at one of those things what it actually does is creates a copy for you whereas normally when you create a new variable and assign in a previous variable ownership of the value moves from the old variable to the new variable um, and you should note at this point that that word move is kind of a, uh, to help us think about what's happening. But normally the, the stuff on the heap at least doesn't actually get moved, but the ownership gets moved. So the new variable is responsible for cleaning up that stuff and the old variable loses that responsibility. All right, so that was our recap. Uh, so let's start talking about like, so the downsides of the model that we've discussed so far. So um, we need more. And what we're talking about in this um, video is the, the more that we need to make this stuff not completely inconvenient and nasty. So let's just, again, this is recap. Let's go back to um, the code that we were looking at last time or similar code where we wanted to calculate the length of a string. So we created a string on line two um, and that variable S1 had ownership of the value of that string. Uh, then we passed S1 in to calculate length. Uh, and the point of calculate length is to calculate the length of the string, but the um, because we passed S1 in to calculate length, ownership of that string value went inside the calculate length function. Uh, then we did some stuff in the calculate length function, and then at line eight, the the variable S that, that's inside calculate length goes out of scope, and that variable has ownership of the string. So at that moment, um, the the value gets cleaned up; it's no longer there. And we get back into the main code, we go on, onto line four, and we try and print out um, the string, S1, and the length, but the string is, uh, no longer belongs to that S1 variable. It's been taken away by calculate length and thrown away, so the value doesn't even exist anymore, so we definitely can't print it out. Um, so, do we get the compile error? No, uh, and, and we saw in the previous um, video, or video before last, uh, or before that, um, that there's a compile error and it says you can't do that because um, S1, because the value has been moved out of S1. Okay, so we also saw some ways that we can fix this problem. Um, so what we could have done is cloned S1 and passed that clone in to calculate length. And then we would have kept 
kept hold of ownership of a string in S1 and made a new string that we passed into calculate length, but that seems really wasteful. Um, and the other solution that we found was that we could actually return S from calculate length as well as the length. Um, we could make a little tuple and put both of them in there, the string and the U size, and return the string back again. And then we'd be able to catch it back on the other side on, say, on line three. Um, and then we'd have the string back again, so we could then print out its length and its value. Um, but all that is a huge faff, isn't it? Like, why do we have to pass it in, then capture it back again? Now we've suddenly got a tuple getting returned from calculate length, and calculate length is really simple. Uh, so if that seemed real a real hassle, uh, that's because it is, and we were we were waiting till now to tell you the better way of doing it. So, what what the better way is is borrowing or references. So it's called borrowing because it's something like what happens in real life when you own something and you let someone else use it, um, but then they're going to give it back, and you're the one who still owns it. Um, now that, that may be a slightly confusing um, analogy. Because in my head, borrowing is kind of is like taking a pointer to something. So in a way, it's it's not not like you're giving it to them. It's like they're able to talk about it or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> point is, um, we can do borrowing. Um, we can let the get length function, which for some reason has changed its name, um, take a reference to our string, but we still own the string. So this is the same example with the variables and, and stuff changed names. So we create this string x on line two. We create a variable holding onto a string on line two called x. Um, and then we pass in a reference to x into the get length function. Um, so x still owns the string, but get length is allowed to talk about the string because we pass in a reference. So the, the way we pass in references, we say ampersand x. That ampersand means like take a reference to in this context. And then in the get length function, instead of taking an argument of type string, you can see here we're taking in an argument of type ampersand string. Um, and that means I'm not taking ownership of a string. I, I can just refer to a string that someone else owns. And the, the reference to it is called arg. Um, and then the interesting thing is once we've got that arg, variable, which is a reference to a string, um, we can just call dot len on it as if we had the string itself. Uh, and that's allowed. Um, and Rust takes care of the fact that um, what you want to do is kind of call len on the, on the, the string that we're referring to. Um, so it looks the same as if we owned it uh, on line eight, but actually we don't. All right, so that's the basic idea of we want we want the get length function to be able to kind of use our thing without owning our thing, which means that we keep on keep hold of ownership of it, and then we can use it on line four, and then it gets deleted when x goes out of scope on line five. Okay. Um, so other things to say about references: the the reference that we've shown so far are immutable, so you're not allowed to change the thing. So here's an example where we, we're making the variable s and we're passing in a reference to s into the change function on line three. And the change function takes in uh, a reference to a string, because on line seven it says ampersand string. And then on line eight, the change function is trying to change that value. It's trying to add on comma world to the string that currently just holds hello. And that is not allowed. And the reason it's not allowed, in the kind of proximate reason it's not allowed, is that on line seven, are, are the type that we take in is an ampersand string, a reference to a string. If we wanted to be able to modify stuff, we would need a mutable reference to a string, right? Makes sense, because it's similar to um, uh, what we talked about before with, with variables, where they by default, they're immutable, you can't change them. And then you have to explicitly say they're mutable. So what we can do is change um, change our program a little bit, change line seven to say we don't just take in a reference to a string, we take in a mutable reference to a string. Now we're allowed to change it when we've while well, we've got that reference to it. But in order to do that, we need to change a little bit more. First of all, we need to change line three to say um, we're not passing in just a reference to a string, not just ampersand stra but a mutable reference to a string. So we say ampersand mute space string. So notice, by the way, um, both on line seven and on line three, 
we said ampersand meet and then a space and then the string. So it's slightly odd that things change from just ampersand string all mushed next to each other to ampersand mute space string. And similarly on line three, ampersand mute space s. It's just a slight wrinkle of the syntax. There's kind of no way around it because you couldn't you couldn't run those two things together because it would look like mutt string or something. You know, it would be a, a different word. So uh, yeah, it takes slightly getting a bit of getting used to. Anyway. So the point is, uh, line seven, we need to say, I want to deal with a mutable string, please. I want you to give me a mutable string, mutable reference to a string. Uh, line three, we say, I want to pass in a mutable reference to S. But in order to be allowed to pass in a mutable reference to someone else, our string itself needs to be mutable. So we also had to change line two. Let me just flip back and forth between. So here's the old version. Here's the new version. You can see three places change. Uh, and yeah, the third one, or the first one, is on line two, in order to be allowed to pass a mutable reference, it needs to be mutable. And that kind of makes sense, right? It would, be, it would be really bad if we had an immutable variable, but we were able to pass a mutable reference to that to someone else. Then we'd be breaking the rule that no one can change that thing because the someone else will be able to change it. Um, yeah, so uh, notice in, in, in this case again on line eight, um, the push through method, we're calling the push through method on on this reference to a string as if it was just a string. Um, so in C++, you'd have to use, uh, if you have a pointer to something, you have to use the kind of arrow operator to say, I want to call a method on it. In this case, in Rust, you don't have anything like that. It's, if you've got a reference to a string, you can just say dot push through, um, and it, 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 call, it will call the method on the string. But there are some cases, rare cases, where um, you need to dereference that reference to get up, to kind of get into the, the string inside. Um, and then you would use a star to dereference it. And we'll see that in a minute. Okay, so when we compile this program, um, not only does it compile now, it also works the way you'd expect. So we, we initialize the string hello, we change it um, inside the change method, and then we print it. And when we print it, it's been changed. So it says hello world. Okay. Um, yeah, so here is the um, dereference operator that I was just talking about. So um, this is one example of a place where you actually need to kind of dereference to say, give me the kind of give me the ability to talk about the underlying value of this reference. Uh, and that situation is is because actually with a mutable reference you can do anything anything with it that you could do to the original, including replacing the value completely with a new value. And the way you do that is this. You say star thing, or in this case star sum string, equals, and then you can assign into it. And that like that kind of overwrites that original string. So if we changed if we change line eight to look like this new line one at the bottom, um, then we would at the end of the program we would print out goodbye because the S the, the S that we passed in to change um, got completely replaced. The value that we a bit behind that reference got completely replaced by this thing. And you're allowed to do that with mutable references. So I guess the point of this is mutable references are really powerful. If this last chunk of this slide doesn't make much sense, don't worry, you, you rarely use it. You probably don't need to think about it for now. Just focus on the, the top program where we can, as long as we've got a mutable thing, we can pass in a mutable reference to that thing, and then we're allowed to change it. But it is not as simple as that. Um, so this all looks very nice and easy, but it, it would go really squiffy if um, if you were just allowed to willy-nilly uh, pass references to other people. Um, so there's some there's some really significant rules around this um, to make sure that you never. So the whole point of all these rules is you never have a reference that is pointing at something that's no longer there or has changed underneath you. Um, uh, so that's the, the reason for these rules, that every reference you have is going to stay valid. Um, but the rules themselves then get a bit hard to understand, maybe. But the underlying reason is if someone gives you a reference to something, you're, that's something you can use consistently and it won't all go wrong. So um, the rules are, if you've got a mutable reference, no one else has got any references to this thing. Right, so if I've got a mutable reference, no one else has any references, mutable or immutable. If I've got an immutable reference to a thing, then there might be other people who have immutable references that can't change, but no one is going to have a mutable reference to this thing. So the point of that is, um, like I said, 
if someone gives me an immutable reference to a thing, that is going to stay the same for the whole time I'm using it. Because the only other people who've got references to it also can't change it. None of us are allowed to change it. Uh, so it's not going to change. Um, and if I've got a mutable reference to a thing, uh, that means no one else has got immutable references to it because I might change it out from under them and that would mess them up, right? That's the basic idea of this. Um, so that is the like rules about who can have what type of reference. Essentially, either lots of people have immutable references or only one person has mutable reference. Um, but there's also this concept of lifetimes. And this um, this can be really confusing and it is sort of advanced rust and we'll, we'll get onto it. But we need to mention it now but not talk about it too much. And that is that the other thing that could go wrong with references, other than someone else changing it while we're looking at it, which is banned by those rules, um, is that it might get dropped, right? It might, um, the owning scope might somehow, um, have finished with it, uh, and, it, and drop it, sort of delete the value so it's not in, it doesn't exist in memory. And if we still had a reference to it at that point, um, we would then be referring to invalid memory. And that's exactly the kind of thing that in uh, other languages like C and C++ cause most security bugs, right? Someone is referring to some memory that they think is valid, but it's actually gone away. So then you, clever people can then poke something else into that bit of memory, um, which makes us do something we didn't mean to do and get confused. And therefore, you know, they can break into our systems and steal all of our balloons or something. So, um, uh, in order to avoid that problem, um, there, there's another rule about references, which is that they can't live longer than the thing that actually owns the memory. Um, which means all of this stuff adds up to the fact that references will at all times point to a valid value. Um, so what exactly we mean by cannot live longer, um, it's going to take some getting used to. So we're not going to talk about it yet. We're going to talk about it later because it's a hard feature of Rust and and you can get by without thinking too much about it uh, for quite a while. Um, okay, so that's all that. Um, yeah, one other thing to say. If, um, if you are familiar with pointers um, from languages like C and C++, um, references are a bit like pointers, but they can never be invalid. Um, and underneath, they're probably implemented similar to that. Uh, so if it helps you to think of them as pointers, you can, but they, like, as you've already seen from this slide, there's a lot of rules around that that are forced by the compiler. So in practice, they're, um, they're not going to be, they, they're not really like pointers. Okay. Um, all right. So the whole point of this system, as I was saying, is that certain types of memory error can't happen with this system. Um, you can take references to things and you know they're always going to be valid. They're never going to change underneath you. Um, and the outcome of this, these, this set of rules plus all the ownership rules is that Rust is so-called memory safe if you use the safe um, subset of Rust. Well, uh, we might talk later about how there's this thing you can do in Rust called unsafe that we're not talking about yet. And that lets you break some of the rules. Um, but if you write um, normal Rust, then Rust is memory safe. That means you'll never accidentally point at a bit of memory that has been dropped. Um, you'll never um, like be wrong about the length of a string because someone changed it underneath you, anything like that. Um, but it's memory safe. But most memory safe languages are memory safe because they use a garbage collector. So you just grab some memory and then um, um, it gets tidied up later and you actually... You never own values. You just kind of refer to them all the time. And there can be lots of references. Um, and then the garbage collector does all the tidying up. But Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, which is really cool because garbage collectors, even though they're amazing, um, have some significant downsides in terms of unpredictable behavior. And it, like maybe slow downs when they try and tidy up memory or just not releasing memory when you, you would like it to be released, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, Rust gets like the best of all possible worlds, essentially, which is um, uh, you can't make memory errors, but also um, you don't have a garbage collector. Um, and we, we kind of, I guess, thought that was impossible um, until Rust came along and showed that it's possible. Um, I, the downside you may be thinking, and I'm certainly thinking, is that 
we have to think about, we have to understand this stuff a little bit more to, to be able to comply with those rules that I described. But um, you get used to it. It becomes quite natural. And it's really satisfying that everything is kind of under your control. Um, stuff is very predictable. Okay, so let's look at some more examples. So um, we, we talked about the rules for references. So that means if we look at this program, maybe you can see um, a problem with this program, or maybe you can see that it will run correctly. So what do you think? We make a, a string s on line two, and it is mutable. Uh, and then on line three, we take a reference, an immutable reference to s, and we call that reference s1. Then on line four, we do the same thing and call that reference s2. And then on line five, we take a mutable reference to s and put that in s3. And then we don't really do anything with them. We just print them out. Um, will that program work? The answer is no, it, it won't work because it breaks one of these rules. We've taken an immutable borrow, I mean, immutable reference to s on line three. And then on line five, we're trying to take a mutable reference and we're not allowed to do that. Um, and actually, Rust helpfully tells you as well that we used S1 on line six. And actually, that's, that's, um, there's a subtle thing going on there, which is actually, if you'd taken that reference S1, but you never used it again, Rust is actually clever enough to say, all right, S1's done with, uh, and I'm going to allow S3 to happen, a mutable reference. Anyway, main point is, because you've got an immutable reference to S, you're not allowed to take a mutable reference to S. So that's just an example of those rules working out. Um, all right, so let's think more about references and how they could work and how that they like need to be valid, right? So let's think about a function called give me a ref, and inside that function on line two, we create a string, put it in a variable called s, and then on line three, we return a reference to that string. And you can see on line one, the return value of this function is ampersand string, so we're returning a, a reference to a string. So does this uh, function look all right, or is there some problem with it? Well, there is a, some problem with this function, which is that, that S owns this string, and on line four, we delete the string, we drop it, and then we return a reference to it so that someone else can refer to it. So if this was allowed, this code, this would be a way of making an invalid reference, right? Uh, a reference that someone has already dropped, um, or a reference to something that someone has already dropped. And that would be bad. So it's OK. Rust protects us from this. Um, what it says is this function's return type contains a borrowed value, but there's no value for it to be borrowed from. Um, and it gives a suggestion here, which uh, I guess might help. In this case, it wouldn't help. So you can kind of ignore the suggestion. But the main point is Rust says, nope, you can't return something you're dropping. Um, so what would we do instead? Well. I mean, in this function, we just have to return a string, right? Not a reference to a string. If you want to create a string and return it, you have to give ownership of that string to the person who's calling it. Otherwise, they can't use it. Um, but if, but sometimes it is a situation where we do want to return a reference to something. For example, if we were like finding something inside a string um, or like picking from two choices, we might want to return back and say, oh, the one I want is the second one. And we would say, you know, refer to it. So, um, this is a, a sort of simple example, I guess. Um, we are the function. This function. This is a function that's going to return a reference to one of the things that was passed into it, right? So um, we've got this um, parameter called input, and the type of it is it's actually a reference to a tuple of a string and an i32, and the return type is a reference to a string. Um, so on line two, we use the dot zero syntax to say, um, "Give me the first thing in the tuple." Um, we're returning uh, a reference to the first thing in the tuple. So the difference here between this example and the previous example is that um, we're being something is being passed into us, and then we are returning a reference to that thing that got passed into us. Actually, a reference is being passed into us, and we're returning a reference to something inside it. So in terms of ownership, you can imagine that this makes sense, right? You it, it, the co code that calls this owns this tuple of a string and an i32. It's letting us refer to it, and then we want to give it back a reference to that thing. So that the thing that we're returning back is still owned by the code that called this function. So this does make sense that the, the person who owns it 
uh, um, we're giving a, a reference back to someone who actually owns the thing. If you see what I mean, so um, it's okay. It's, this isn't this isn't an invalid reference because by the time this this function returns, um, the calling code still owns the code that we're referring to. So. Um, like this is awkward because all this stuff is kind of really caveated by this like might make sense not that this definitely does make sense um and um the thing that i'm skipping over here is lifetimes so this makes sense if the thing we're returning has a lifetime that is that means that it will still be valid for the right amount of time if you see what i mean um so as i said we're not discussing lifetimes yet and actually in this code um, there are these references do have lifetimes, but it's all implicit here. Rust can kind of work out the lifetimes from from the code, but there is a way of explicitly saying, um, like, I want I want it to live as long as this thing. I guess is the way of saying it. Um, we'll get to that, and it'll be at least as incoherent as this explanation. Um, okay, so um, yeah, this is the other way of doing the thing, which I think is like the preferred thing in the first example, um, which is. If you want to return a string, just return a string. Don't return a reference to a string. So that second example is nice and simple. If you're going to create a string, return that string so that the person who called you has ownership. So yeah, the, the top example here um, very quickly gets very tricky. So while you're still learning about references borrowing and stuff like that, and you haven't learned about lifetimes yet, I would say uh, in almost all cases, avoid returning a reference because you really need to understand what's going on underneath to return a reference. It's important for us to point out here, you can do that and it, you can make it make sense and it can still be safe and not cause um, memory errors. Um, but in order to really um, make that work, you've got to start thinking about lifetimes, which look confusing and maybe are confusing um, but definitely makes sense once you've got your head around it. But it's definitely worth getting your head around references and stuff first, thinking about lifetimes later. So um, I guess the the example to keep in your head um, is, let's go back. The way we should think about references is either this way, where we're passing in immutable reference because we want to change our thing, or where was it? Or this way, where we're passing in an immutable reference because we just want to kind of interrogate the the variable, ask its length, something like that. So those cases where we pass in a reference to someone else, we still own the thing, we pass in a reference to someone else and they just use that reference. Those um, are like 95% of the times you want to use references. Um, and it's really useful. And it basically solves the problem we had from last video, which was... Um, why do I have to pass in ownership and then pass it back again? It all gets a hassle. Well, you don't have to. You can pass in a reference to the thing and then use the thing. Hope that's helpful. Um, we're getting on to some of the stuff in Rust that is hard. Um, not as hard as lifetimes, but properly hard. Um, so um, questions in the uh, comments, welcome. Um, especially if you want me to go over things, maybe when I'm doing the exercises, I can like stop and... like. Um, go over a particular thing or, or if you're coming to this later and you have questions maybe um, I can answer in the comments or make another video just trying to go over something that I, I said it wasn't very clear um, welcome questions hope this stuff is useful uh, next time we will continue to some more of the so-called advanced syntax which is really like just how you get by in normal rust uh, with things like structs and other stuff to do with types um, uh, yeah hope you enjoyed see you next time